not too many of us can uh, pull off the bell bottoms that Millie has on today. She can pull it off just fine. I just wanted to just, the third verse of that uh, breathe on me breath of God, breathe on me breath of God till I am wholly thine, until this earthly part of me glows with thy fire divine. I hope that is your prayer today, that you long to glow with God's fire divine. And I've got to ask, though, who is your God? What's He like? You see, yours and my perception of God and His character has an incredible influence on several areas of our lives. Do you view or, or see God as a policeman in the sky? He's watching you to enforce his law just in case you take, take a step out of line. Do you picture him as a harsh judge, robe and all, sitting on the bench? Maybe you even think he's an abusive father, or maybe he's kind of a, a disconnected dad to you. Let me just say again, yours and my perception of God and his character has incredible influence on several areas of our lives. And I'm excited today to uh, bring to you this message based on Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. Before we read the scriptures, let's go to our memory verse here. And would you recite it with me? 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. God, we thank you so much for this opportunity we have to open up the Scriptures. My prayer, God, is that everybody who is gathered here this morning, whether physically or whether they're listening online, my prayer is that we would see that we have a need. We, we, we would see that we have a need to grow closer to you, Lord. That we have um, areas in our lives that maybe we haven't fully submitted to you. That, Lord, we would see you as the answer. You as the answer. We love you so much, God. I pray that you would use this message for your glory, that people would grow in their faith, that they would be more fully equipped, uh, fully equipped so that they can be complete, Lord, in you. In Jesus' name, amen. So again, we're in Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to start with verse 7. And go through verse 11. And it says this. And these are Jesus' words. Jesus was speaking. If you have one of those Bibles that has the red letters, these are red. Mine is minor, minor black. It's just, it's kind of plain. So anyway, it says this. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him. And we'll stop there. So today, you and I are going to observe three commands that Jesus gave to his followers in this passage. And he gave these commands 
so they could comprehend his and his father's character. Again, you comp comprehending God's character is so, so critical, folks. For you to understand the heart of your father is very, very important. So he starts off by just saying, ask. Ask. When a person asks, he or she admits that they have a need. That's a big deal. They're admitting ignorance, that they're insufficient, that they are lacking. So when you ask, you realize someone has something that you don't have. You are lacking in that. When a person asks, humility is present, uh, unlike the husband who won't ask for directions. Doesn't that always, you know, now, now we always have the, the GPS on the cell phone, uh, except for some of you in this room that don't have one of those phones. And there's many times those of us who have the smartphone wish we had your phone uh, because, yeah, anyway, that's a whole other sermon. Nevertheless, but it's like the, 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 the dad that, you know, uh, back in the day before every vehicle had a GPS in it, um, back in the day when, you know, honey, would you just pull over and ask directions? No, nah, we'll be all right. Well, I'll, I'll get us there. Mm -hmm. So these people also, they've resigned to the fact that God has what they are looking for. He possesses what they are lacking. God possesses what they're... What does the Bible say about this humility that accompanies asking? What does the Bible say about this humility? Well, in Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15, it says, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. So God dwells with the one who's humble. That's where he dwells. And might I just add, it's because there's room for him. If there's pride, there's no room for him to come and, and be a part. If there's pride, there's just there's no space for him. He's not welcome. But if you're humble, well, you're, you're willing to let him in. I like also how Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and uh, saves the crushed in spirit. Ah, great passage for those of you who might be going through just a heart-wrenching, very difficult time. But that also just, it, it provides this picture of, of humility, does it not? God is near and saves the broken and contrite person. There's room for him. The next command, so not only are we told to seek, or to ask, we're also told to seek. Where Jesus says, seek. Specifically, uh, he said, seek and you will find. When a person seeks, he or she is pursuing something or someone they have yet to obtain. There's a pursuit. And it's there again. It's something that I don't yet have. So I'm seeking it. King Solomon, he was instructed by David, King David, to seek. In 1 Chronicles 28, 9, And you, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Interesting. Those were the words from David to Solomon. And here we also see uh, King Asa. He's another one in, first, uh, in 2 Chronicles 15, 1 and 2. The Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he'll forsake you. I love that promise that was given to those Old Testament uh, prophets and kings. If you seek him, you'll find him. 
Would you agree with me the key word is if? That's a big if. <laughs> such a short little word, but is it not such a powerful word in this text? If. If. If you seek him, he'll be found by you. Folks, I've got to say, God does not play hide and seek. He's thrilled to reveal himself when we seek him. I hope you don't picture God like that. Like that he's just always playing hide and seek with you. Oh, am I over here? Oh, no. Dodging, weaving, elusive. I love how Proverbs 8, 17 says, I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently. They find me. They find me. So God is not elusive. Therefore, we can conclude that God is near me. He's near me. He's near you. He's not far away, dodging behind the trees. Oh, boy, did you, as a kid, just love playing hide and seek? I mean, it was the best, especially if you could do it outside. Um, and I remember times of playing hide and seek. Not that I was that great at it. Was never the fastest kid. Um, that or, or, or games like that, that also include some, some stealth like capture the flag. Any of you ever play? You ever play capture the flag? Raise your hand up. Yeah, capture the flag. What a game to play and just uh, try to, to, to be elusive and sneaky. But guess what? That's not God. That's not him. James 4, 8, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify hearts, you double-minded. Draw near. He'll draw near to you. And let me tell you what. The step that God needs to take to you is a very short step. <laughs> As it says, draw near to him, he'll draw near to you. It's not like God's, you know, 20 miles away, and it's like, give me a minute. <laughs> no, it's as soon as you turn, it's, it's like, that person who startles you that you didn't realize was standing right right back here, just out of your peripheral, and it's like, oh, I didn't know. Yeah, he's that close. It's, it's not like you've got to go traveling for him, searching, walking, striving, striving to get near to him. You just turn to him, he's there. The third thing that we are commanded to do is knock. So, knock. When a person knocks, they are looking at a closed door in front of them. Isn't that right? <laughs> I, you, usually when you're knocking, uh, you, you're, you're staring, you know, you're staring at this door. That's right. Maybe there's, you know, there's a peephole. Maybe there's a ring doorbell. Maybe, you know, but nevertheless, you're staring you're staring at something that is just closed and in front of you. The path appears to be obstructed. Knocking is not necessarily random. Hmm. Think about that for a moment. It's not necessarily random. It's not like you go to some big apartment building over in Columbus. We don't have those around here. A uh, big apartment building over in Columbus, and you're just going down the hall, and you're just, you know, you're knocking on the doors randomly. Knock, knock. Knock, knock. Yeah, it's, it's not like that. It's, it's not like just, oh, maybe I can find him here. Maybe I can find him there. I just got to knock all over the place. <laughs> uh, no, it's not like that. You believe that what you are looking for is beyond the door in which you are knocking. It's right beyond this door. Right beyond this door. And what does he say? Knock, and it will be opened to you. And verse 8 says, for everyone who asks, receive. It's kind of just a reiteration, is it not? Of what verse 7 says, for everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. So kind of restating 
what was already said in verse 7. And then in verse 9, Jesus solidifies his point by illustrating this beautiful parent-child relationship. He says, Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks him for fish, will give him a serpent? So he uses this parent-child relationship. Parents, I like those of you who are parents, I would like to think that when your child is hungry, will you give him a snake or a rock? Come on now. You get what Jesus is saying here. Would you give him something that cannot be consumed or something that's going to harm him or her? No, you're not going to do that. And so in verse 11, Jesus again, he does this exaggerating or overstatement by calling the parents evil. Did you catch that? Um, Now, kids, don't you just use this against your parents. But it says, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? You know, he, he exaggerates by calling the parents evil. Man's love compared to God's love looks evil. Why? Because, well, humans are capable of choosing wrong. They are, they're fallible. You and I are fallible. We're very capable of doing wrong. And some of you would say, yeah, that's so true. Uh, I, I find myself, you know, very capable of choosing wrong at time, from time to time. But the reality, so that is why Jesus is making this exaggeration, this overstatement here about, you know, calling, what, what, if, if you who are evil, you know, give good things to your kids. What about your heavenly father? Hmm. So one of the, just the main point here is what do you expect from God? What do you expect from him? How do you believe God will respond to your requests when you ask and seek and knock? How do you believe God's going to respond to your request? I I love how William Barclay put it. He said this, God will always answer our prayers, but he will answer them in his way. And his way will be the way of perfect wisdom and of perfect love. Often, if he answered our prayers as we at the moment desired it, would be the worst thing possible for us. For in our ignorance, we often ask for gifts which would be our ruin. This saying of Jesus tells us not only that God will answer, but that God will answer in wisdom and in love. So with that in mind, I have to ask you, another question, and that question is, what determines what God gives us? So when you ask and seek and knock, when you're you're asking God for something, what determines what God gives you? Who knows our best need for us? God? Yeah, God knows what's best. He's your Abba Father. Your Abba Father. And maybe you, you, you haven't heard that term a lot, Abba, for your father. But it's a term of endearment that is used in the scriptures for our heavenly father, Abba, Father. It's a term of endearment. It's a term of endearment, meaning like these, these kiddos that were up here, you know, you think of a kid that's, and, you know, anywhere between, you know, the ages of, of like four and, and seven and these kids at that age that at that age, many times, what do they call their dad? Daddy. 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 Abba. Father. Daddy.
So I want you to think about something. I want to remind you about something I talked about last week, and that is that God is everywhere. So he is not, you know, confined to a specific location. God is all-knowing, and God is all-powerful. So he perfectly knows what you need. He perfectly knows what you need. That's the next blank in your notes. So we, this is really where we need to camp out today, folks, right here, that God is everywhere, He's all-knowing, and He's all-powerful, knowing perfectly, perfectly what you need. Perfectly what you need. That is not an exaggeration. That is not an overstatement. That is exactly what the Scriptures tell us about our Abba Father, our Daddy. Why in the world would God tell us to ask if we cannot receive, even specifically what we request? If I ask for something specific, can God grant me that? Yes, He sure can. He sure can. We can receive what we ask for. However, it is up to God if that is what is best for us. It's up to Him if that's what's best for us. What does this come down to? What does this all boil down to? You and I must be able to have simple trust. Very, very, very simple trust in God, in His character. And yes, it's like that child that never has to question, the child that holds Daddy's hand never has to question whether Daddy has their best interest in mind, never has to wonder if Daddy is just out to get them and do evil to them, never has to worry. And I understand some of you might not have had a Daddy like that. I get that. But what I'm speaking of here. Is, is this simple, childlike trust in God. How can we learn to trust God like that? Well, if you're like me, you certainly are more likely to trust people that you know. <laughs> Isn't that just normal? We trust people more that we know. Now, some of you even have problems trusting people you know. Some of you have a real, real problem trusting anybody you don't know. But we are naturally inclined to trust people that we know. This starts at the most basic place of trust when you and I come to a place in our lives and determine that we are sinners in need for a Savior, the Savior, Jesus. As John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Simple, simple basic belief. Romans 10, 9 and 10, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So it's this basic basic place, this basic, very basic level of trust that begins with recognizing I need a Savior because I've fallen short of God's standard. But also I've got to point out that as we start with that basic, basic place of trust and belief, we also have to come to a place where we recognize that God is worthy of our trust. He's worthy of your trust. He is worthy. Uh, Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not man that he should lie or son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? You can trust him. He's trustworthy. Psalm 89, 34, I will not violate my covenant or alter the word that went forth from my lips. We can trust Him. He's trustworthy.
also, as I've already kind of established, but I'm going to, I got to just say again that God has the power. He has the power to fulfill His plans and purposes. He does. As Isaiah 14, 24 says, The Lord of hosts has sworn, as I have planned, so shall it be. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. So shall it stand. God's plans, they're perfect because His his purpose is perfect. (laughs) Easy for me to say. God's plans are perfect because His purpose is perfect. And you might just be thinking to yourself, you're just kind of rephrasing some things that have already been established. Maybe so, but I feel like we've got to understand God at a deeper level and trust Him at a deeper level, folks. He is worthy of our trust. He's worthy of your trust. Romans 8, 28, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. His purpose. We have plenty of evidence also that God has shown Himself trustworthy to people recorded throughout the Scriptures. He's shown Himself to be trustworthy. Psalm 100 verse 5, For the Lord is good, His steadfast love endures forever, and His faithfulness to who? Uh, That generation back then? No, all generations. All generations. Generations from, from the years gone by, generations for for all future generations, even right now, this generation. Trustworthy. That's who God is. Faithful. And His steadfast love endures to you. Whether you perceive it or not, His steadfast love endures for you. This is true. I've also got to say, And and just as I conclude with a couple thoughts here, hang with me. We should trust God simply because there's no other logical alternative. There's no other logical alternative. What else are you going to do? Who else else are you going to trust like God? Who else are you going to trust like Him? Is God worthy of your trust? What is your perception of God? Now hang with me just one more moment. I want to conclude with, I want to conclude with, and this is just how my little brain works, okay? (laughs) My mind jogs back to theologian and creative writer C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It's a conversation between Susan, Edmund, Lucy, and Mr. Beaver. Who is Aslan? asked Susan. Aslan? said Mr. Beaver. Why, don't you know? He's the king. He's the lord of the whole wood. But not often here, you understand. Never in my time or my father's time, but the The word has reached us that he has come back. He is in Narnia at this moment. He'll settle the white queen, all right. It is he, not you, that will save Mr. Tumnus. She won't turn him into stone, too, said Edmund. Lord, love you, son of Adam. What a simple thing to say, answered Mr. Beaver with a great laugh. Turn him into stone? If she can stand on her two feet and look at him in the face... It'll be the most she can do and more than I expect of her. No, no, he'll put all to rights, as it says in an old rhyme in these parts. Wrong will be right when Aslan comes in sight. At the sound of his roar, sorrows will be no more. When he bears his teeth, winter meets its death. And when he shakes his mane, he shall have, we shall have spring again. You'll understand when you see him. But shall we see him? asked Susan. Why, daughter of Eve, 
That's what I brought you here for. I'm to lead you where you shall meet him, said Mr. Beaver. Is, is he a man, asked Lucy. Aslan, a man, said Mr. Beaver sternly, certainly not. I tell you, he is the king of the wood and the son of the great emperor beyond the sea. Don't you know who is the king of the beasts? Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I would thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or just else just silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Do you believe that God is good? He isn't necessarily safe, especially to those who reject him. He's, he's not safe at all. But to those who call him Lord and Savior, who call Jesus Lord and Savior, he, he is safe. He's just as well. He is, he is a just God, but he's good. He loves you. He has your best interest in mind. So when you ask, and by the way, the verb tense here where, where Jesus says, ask, seek, and knock, it's, it's in this verb tense that says, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. It's, it's a continuous. We, we are to continue to ask and seek and knock because we believe God is good and that he loves us and he is sovereign over all things. He can be trusted with what you ask him and what I ask him. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we can trust you how frightening it would be if we think of this king of kings, this great lion of Judah, that if you had ill intent for us at all times or meant us harm. But God, we believe that you love us. We believe that you have our best interest at heart. And so what do you tell us to do? You tell us to ask and to keep on asking to keep on seeking, and to keep on knocking. And so, Lord, may we not give up hope when things seem hopeless. May we be willing to pursue in asking and seeking and knocking. Maybe, yes, maybe getting what we, re what we request, but trusting you fully with the results at what is best for us. As you exist outside of time and space, knowing what's best. We love you so much, Lord. Thank you for loving us beyond our imagination. In Jesus' name, amen. Our last song is To God Be the Glory. Please stand and sing with us. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let 
the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. O oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest defender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done. And great are rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people. Joys, oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Amen. What a great song for us to end on. Oh, sons and daughters of the King, go and be light to the world where there's darkness. Go shine bright for him. In Jesus' name, amen.